What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources, the Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment what I saw these young African Americans doing it was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up. And to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the Cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes. And I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
How you doing? Is everything all right out there? I thought I was hearing a bit of conversation at the front of the room. I want to make sure everyone's all right. Everybody all right? OK. Well, welcome to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. My name is Novella Ford, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions. Thank you for joining us tonight for On the Page, Representing Black Muslim Life, presented in collaboration with the Metropolitan Opera and featuring our panelists, Zaire Ali, Donna Austin, and Kazim Abdullah. Unfortunately, Will Liverman, who is the lead baritone in X, The Life of Malcolm X, is not able to join us tonight due to health challenges. However, let's please wish him well and hope that he will take the stage on Saturday during the live HD uh, simulcast coming from the Met Opera, which, by the way, you can um, go to the Apollo to watch if you have not had a chance yet. Uh, to see it at the Met Opera. I will tell you more about our panelists in a few. As you saw in the video, the Schomburg is dedicated to the collection, preservation, and interpretation of global black experiences. We have a, an ex extensive collection of audio and moving image materials related to firsthand account of experiences of black Muslims in the US and the Nation of Islam. We also have materials from the Malcolm X collection, also including LPs, documentaries, and so much more. These materials are best experienced in our moving image and recorded sound division, which we call MIRS. Uh, so please, the division will reopen later this week, so I recommend visiting the division. All you need is a library card to access uh, the hundreds of collections that are available there. One of those items is the Malcolm X Make It Plain is Malcolm X Make It Plain, a film produced for a television program, the, uh, the American Experience in 1993. It features rare interviews, archival footage, photographs, and an original, original musical score. Make It Plain takes the viewer on Malcolm's own intellectual journey. It features many interviews with his family, friends, and associates. We have free copies of the companion book, which is by the same name. Maybe you saw it outside uh, on the table. If there were no more copies on the table, we will put some more out at the end of the program, but they are free. And it has a lot of the same materials that were in the documentary. It was actually put together by William Strickland and the Malcolm X documentary production team. We are able to fulfill our mission thanks in part to the support of the Schomburg Society. Do we have any Schomburg Society members here? Right on, thank you, thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Schomburg Society is a membership group made up of supporters from around the world. Your support of the Schomburg through attendance at tonight's public program and through financial giving helps to ensure that the Schomburg remains the intellectual and cultural heart of black communities. I want you to mark your calendar for the few remaining programs we have as we head into the December holiday season. On November 30th, we have the African Diaspora um, Film Festival uh, community screenings, which features three feature films uh, discussing African youth and society. We also have jazz saxophonist Robbie Coltrane joining us on December 14th as part of Carnegie Hall Citywide. He is the son of jazz legend John Coltrane and pianist Alice Coltrane. And we also have our closing exhibition. We have our exhibition closing on December 4th, where marking time will be on view from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. So please don't wait to see the exhibition, but certainly if you need some of those extra hours in the day, December 4th, the closing day, will be the perfect day, as we'll remain open till 9 p.m. There will also be a conversation called The Afterlife of Incarceration with the curator, Dr. Nicole Fleetwood, along with Drs. Emily Wang and Ruben Jonathan Miller. Please visit our website at schomburg.org to learn more and to register on Eventbrite. I've been looking forward to today's conversation as the life of Malcolm X on stage at the Met Opera prompted this conversation, as well as the publication of Temple Folk, a new collection of short stories by Aaliyah Bilal, centering the lived experiences of black Muslims grappling with faith, family, and freedom in America. It presented an opportunity the way art always does. Art gives us an opportunity to grapple with challenging questions in our individual lives as well as society. It's been exciting to have writers, artists, and musicians place black Muslim life at the center of narratives that value the interiority of these lives and not just the political. 
though, let's face it, every breath that we take in this country feels like a political act. Aliyah Bilal was tapped to join us in this conversation. However, that same debut collection, Temple Folk, caught the eye of some very thoughtful readers and is a finalist for tonight's National Book Award. So we wish her well and probably by the end of this program. Yes, give her a round of applause so in case when she watches this and if she wins that she will know that Harlem had her back. So you can pick up a copy or purchase the book um, from our Schomburg shop, which is open this evening. But if you're not able to purchase the book, I'm sure you can visit one of your local libraries and take it out. I want you to take this time to silence your cell phones as I begin to tell you a little bit about our participants. Kazim Abdullah is a formidable opera conductor with a repertoire of over 30 operas. He is recognized in the classical musical, music industry for connecting with audiences through his well-executed and in inspiring concerts. This year, Kazim Abdullah conducts Anthony Davis's groundbreaking and influential opera, X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X. The newly revised score, which provides a layered jazz inflected setting for the esteemed, uh, for the esteemed writer Thulani Davis's libretto, will make its and has made its Metropolitan Opera debut this month. Zaire Ali, who is our moderator, is an educator and oral historian with more than a decade of experience directing nationally recognized public history and cultural heritage initiatives. His work lies at the intersection of oral history, historic preservation, and narrative change. He is currently the inaugural executive director of the Hutchins Institute for Social Justice at the Lawrenceville School, an innovative education initiative supporting social justice teaching and practice through scholarship, programming, and experiential learning. In addition, he is executive producer of American Muslims, A History Revealed, a digital film series and featured length broadcast documentary currently in production. Lastly, joining the panel will be Donna Austin, Dr. Donna Austin, who is an anthropologist, writer, and public intellectual, whose research interests include race and gender, religion, policing, protests, digital ethnography, and Islam in America. Dr. Austin has published journal articles and book chapters on the historical contributions of African American Muslims in the arts, culture, and social justice movements, the intersections of Islamophobia and anti-blackness, gender Islamophobia, black Islam in US politics, race, religion, and gender in the digital spaces. Her work has also been published and covered by various media outlets. She is currently serves as a foundation anthropologist for disciplinary conversations and public events at the Werner Grin Foundation. I hope, Dr. Austin, that that is still correct. I meant to ask you about that. But before we get into the conversation, I would like to invite Marcia Sells, who is the Chief Diversity Officer and Assistant General Manager, Employee and Community and community relations person at the Metropolitan Opera who is part of the Y team from the Met Opera who helped us bring this program together today. Please welcome Marcia. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Oh, got to be more lively. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much. I'm really very excited to be here. I feel at home. I, I was just saying backstage that I had done research here for my thesis when I was in college at Barnard, so this is a very important space. Um, we at the Metropolitan Opera are very excited that you are all here this evening, and we're extremely grateful to Novella Ford and to the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture for partnering with us on this project. We are also excited about the work that we have been doing with New York Public Libraries in our outreach and audience engagement to bring in new audiences for many of the new operas that we're doing, but also as part of building new connections. The Met's bold new production of Malcolm X, or of X, The Life and Time of Malcolm X, as you have heard, is directed by the Tony Award nominee, Robert O'Hara, and also with music by Pulitzer Prize winning Anthony Davis tells the most amazing story about a really key civil rights leader here and also an inextricable, an inextricable member of the Harlem community. We are excited that you, we hope that some of you will also be able to take an opportunity to come to the performance here um, actually at the Metropolitan Opera. We have cards 
outside that also provide a, a QR code with discounts, um, and we look forward. But also, as Novella mentioned, there will be a free screening of the opera on Saturday at the Apollo, so that we do hope that if you can't find community at the Met, please indeed find community here in the Harlem area for this amazing screening. Um, without further ado, I am going to introduce Kazim Abdullah, who will introduce uh, a clip so that you will have a chance to at least hear some of Will Liverman. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Marcia. I'm curious, is, has anyone yet seen Malcolm X at the Met? Has it, yeah, just a few people, great. Um, uh, so you're about to see two different clips and they're in backwards order actually. The first clip is from Act Two and it's when Malcolm X first meets Elijah Muhammad while he's in prison. And you'll see that there's this back and forth between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad and he's very, um, um, Elijah Muhammad is very sort of convincing in his words and it's almost like a kind of a, um, it's like a lovely sort of duet between these two major protagonists in the opera. The first, and then the second clip is actually from Act One. And Act One, at the end of Act One, Malcolm X, we see him for the first time at the end of Act One when he's um, in prison, and he's basically seething and angry, and you start already to sort of hear his life philosophy and his views about race and about um, black society and life. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start with uh, the, the first clip from Act Two. I 
I don't normally think about Malcolm X, so to see this story right. being told here at yeah. the Met is, is amazing. It's so impressive. I mean, I think to see someone reimagine how an opera relates to its audience in these times is so necessary. Beautiful. It was very beautiful. The costumes were exquisite. The costumes are amazing. The story is definitely true to the autobiography of Malcolm X. The voice is amazing. I'm a big fan of all of the singers. Leah Hawkins, Will Liverman, Victor, they're amazing. Singing is wonderful, the dancing is phenomenal. Just a very strong message of his inner journey. We're showing him in a different light and at the same time enhancing and involving those of our culture inside of that experience as well. My nephew is here, I'm here, multi-generational. It attracts a new audience, which is what the opera needs. I think it's great. I'm really thrilled that they brought this production to the Met. I feel really included. Stunning, breathtaking. I thought it was great. I was really impressed. That's amazing. Fire ship in my bones, champion, and now this. It's like, thank you, Met. These productions should be done more often, absolutely. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is such an exciting time to have this conversation because we are gathering at an important moment for um, black Muslim life on the page and on the stage. Uh, we have two operas. We have X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, and there's also an opera, I think that's on the West Coast right now, Omar, uh, which is written by, I think the libretto is written by Rhiannon Giddens 
and it just won the Pulitzer Prize um, for music uh, this year. We also have, as we've, um, as, as Novella mentioned, Aaliyah, Aaliyah Bilal's book um, that's up for a National Book Award, Temple Folk. And so black Muslim lives, communities, histories, politics, economics, religion, culture, um, have fueled black cultural production and inspired black culture and American culture for, I think, we're gonna say centuries, and I'll explain why centuries. Um, and so black Muslims have showed up on the page and on the stage in different ways. And tonight we hope to recover, explore, and unpack some of that. And I think one of the, the first places we have to start when we're talking about on the page is with some history, and that is with Omar ibn Said, who um, was an enslaved African brought to the United States in 1807, authored 14 manuscripts in Arabic, including his autobiography in 1831, which is the only known um, Arabic autobiography written by an enslaved person in the United States. And this is the inspiration for the opera Omar. So my question first is to Donna, like why, why is it important for us to think about, when we talk about black Muslims on the page mm -hmm. and Kazim, um, we talk about black Muslims on the page uh, to start with someone actually writing themselves mm -hmm. onto the page. What does that signify? Um, I think uh, for me, thinking about um, Omar Ibn Said's autobiography, um, it, it, it almost feels like his attempt to drop an anchor in the middle of a sea um, that in some ways was threatening to overtake his person. And so to find his footing both for himself, right, to, as a reminder of who he is or was and who he, you know, sort of Finding your, I mean, the, the experience of enslavement is, as we all um, might imagine, and in ways that we can't even imagine, is incredibly disorienting. I mean, people, you're kidnapped, you're taken from your home by force, you're subject to all sorts of violence and brutality, you're put in the hold of a dark ship where you, you like, do you, nothing, you don't know what's going on. You don't know where you're gonna end up. You don't know if you're gonna live, if you're gonna die. Um, you come to this place and then all sorts of things happen, right? That, you know, you're, you're forced to labor. Your, your name is taken away from you. Your, your, your family is taken, you know, everything that you knew that sort of anchors you as a person is, is gone. So you have to find new ground to stand on. And so I can imagine that for, for somebody to be in those sorts of circumstances and to be able to write themselves um, in, their, in the language that they, you know, not in English, but in the, in the language that they brought with them, right? To remember their spiritual um, and to document um, themselves spiritually, right? It, passages from the Quran, right? All of these different things. Again, when your, your religion is being forcibly taken away from you, or at least under a great deal of pressure, right? This seems to me like, a, like he's writing for his life, right, in some ways, but also writing for us um, to, to be able to sort of, um, it's important for us to remember who he was for all sorts of reasons. Um, and as somebody who became Muslim centuries later, um, it's, it's an anchor for me, right, to sort of to tie my own lineage to, not just sort of what happened to my ancestors in this immediate land, um, but also sort of anchoring me to Africa in a different way. So it's, it's you know, it, it really just feels like a, a way um, the key really, he really had to like write for you know, for, for his life, for, for his memory and for ours. I, I want to tie this into the ex opera, which I'll throw to Kazim. Um, and, you know, thinking about how just the convention of autobiography, at least in, in America, 
uh, I think Ben Franklin is like, has the template. And um, it's a story of self-making, of how you became. And Ben Franklin's autobiography opens with, and my people came from here, and they came from there. It's very much like, I know where I came from. Um, and for a black autobiography, uh, usually, whether it's like Frederick Douglass or Harriet Jacobs, you know, the narratives that came out of, of the slave narratives, um, it highlights the contrast of existence, right? Like, I don't know where mm -hmm. we came from. Um, and so for Omar Ibn Said to, to have this hold um, and write himself into existence challenges mm -hmm. that um, disorientation. It also challenges the ways that literacy was used as a reason to explain the lack of intellect, supposedly, uh, and justify enslavement. Um, and Malcolm's autobiography does some of this work too, right? Malcolm's autobiography opens with his first memory of a racial attack on his family, yes. right? Um, so he's upending the autobiography. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Kazim, if, if we think about both Omar Ibn Said and Malcolm X as writing themselves into being through their autobiography, what does it mean for this to show up in an, on an opera stage? For, for a life like Malcolm or Omar Ibn Said? Uh, well, having actually conducted both operas, uh, I actually conducted Omar with the Los Angeles Opera last season. Um, it's kind of amazing, I mean, to be able to um, hear their stories um, framed in the context of music and in an operatic framework, which is very large scale and artistic. And it's pretty incredible to be able to, it's been incredible for me to sort of have to study the source material, reading the autobiography, reading the, the autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley. Uh, oh, you know, there's a wonderful book that sort of gives a translation about the manuscript of Omar bin Said, and I read that, and I actually got to see the manuscript at the Library of Congress, so that was also interesting to see. But it's pretty amazing to, like I feel very fortunate to be alive and working today to have had this chance to be able to lead the interpretations of these works because I think both of these men had incredible life journeys um, that, that are sort of very operatic, like, you know, they had to overcome obstacles and they had to find their way through the world. And when you see great operas, the, the, that's kind of a main point. And I just remember, oh, like, you know, as you were talking about Omar just now, like, I was trying to, like, remember Rhiannon's words, and she has this wonderful phrase, um, tell your story, Omar, you must, because if you don't, your memories will fade into dust. And so if you think about the, yeah, you know, um, when you actually see what he wrote, it's maybe like 15 handwritten pages on like very small paper this big on both sides of the paper. And he writes this whole story on both sides of the paper. And when you see it in the Arabic and you think, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, like paper and pens were not so readily available to everybody. So the fact that it's like maybe like 25 pages, but very small, but like, you know, he tells the whole saga of his life. And I think, just think that's incredible. Yeah. I, I, I want us to come back to why opera. Um, but before, I think it's important to retrace how black Muslims have showed up on stage. Um, and I think one of the first uh, appearances is actually in a black Muslim produced play. Um, in the late 1950s, The Nation of Islam, uh, Louis X, then now known as Louis Farrakhan, um, had authored a play called or Organa, which is a Negro backwards, purposely so, um, and another play called The Trial, which put white supremacy on trial for its crimes against humanity. So, so the stage was always, you know, if writing yourself into a book on page was one thing, the stage was also a place where people understood um, the need to establish um, themselves in their presence. Um, and then in 1968, Amiri Baraka's A Black Mass, um, which was a play based on the Nation of Islam's Yaqub story, uh, the creation of the white race, um, that was performed with Sun Ra's orchestra. Um, you've had Jeff uh, um, uh, Stetson's 
the meeting which dramatizes and fictionalizes an imagined meeting between Martin and Malcolm. You have One Night in Miami by Kemp Powers, uh, which famously was made into a film um, directed by Regina King, which uh, also dramatizes um, that night before Cassius Clay's fight between a meeting of Sam Cooke, Jim, Jim Brown, Cassius, and, and Malcolm. So Black Muslim Lives have been showing up on stage uh, and on page, um, but it does seem that much of the work about black Muslims has been confined to sociological, mm -hmm. journalistic, documentarian kinds of studies. And I wondered how has that constrained the more creative work? Um, because even as I read Aliyah Bilal's book, which is short stories that are fictional, I almost found myself often slipping into thinking I was reading memoir. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so I wonder for both of you, how do you, you know, how has the, the ways people have looked at black Muslims, and, and we should say that um, black Muslim communities are incredibly diverse, um, and we, also, we tend to collapse everything to the nation of Islam, which is a really powerful historical narrative. Um, but how, how is the, the treatment, maybe the scholarly and journalistic treatment of black Muslims, constrained or maybe even enabled certain kinds of creative output? Um, you know, I, I, I think I wonder if part of the reason why this is so is because we have to deal with so much fictionalizing mm -hmm. of, our, of our existence. And what I mean by that is it's very difficult um, to get people to actually take black people writ large, Muslim people as a category. But God, when you put those two things together and actually do like a real reasonable, complex, nuanced, interesting uh, treatment of our histories, our, our, our life experiences, our struggles, our triumphs, whatever, there's so much sensationalism, mm -hmm. right, in how we get narrated on the six o'clock news or in, in academia, in the sphere in which I work, you know, right? Um, I mean, I, I know there's so much, <laughs> there's so much that I read about Muslims and, I'm, and this is like peer reviewed, what, scholarly literature and I'm just like, what the hell is this, right? So I wonder if this drive, right, for, for black, when black Muslims start to tell our stories in many ways, a lot of times maybe the impulse is we, we just gotta set the record straight um, on some level. And then we can kind of start dealing with the imagination, right? Um, so, I, so, so maybe the answer to the question that you're asking in part, it's not the only thing I don't think, but I think maybe part of it is the constraints of sort of this white supremacist caricature, caricature, set of caricatures, right, that we have to contend with um, has done some things to sort of um, bring our storytelling and imagination and, and that sort of thing, you know, sort of like we, we don't, we can't afford that, right, because we're all, you know, we're always sort of struggling against these, you know, these real world things that we have to contend with, right? So I think there's a way in which, and I, you know, and I think black writers of all, um, you know, of all, you know, Muslim or not, right, have had to contend with this. And this is, we were talking about Toni Morrison, like before, um, before the program started, you know, how she, you know, sort of adamantly decided that she was going to write what she wanted to write. Um, without sort of being con overly concerned with the white gaze, right? And this was sort of a, a, a you know, a, a literary, um, but also sort of a philosophical approach to her work that she took, right? And so, and there are ways in which being able to do that, I think, um, opens up doors to the imagination that, that actually, um, you know, sort of promote a real flourishing of the literary arts and fictionalized you know, um, types of portrayals because you're not, 
you, you don't have to sort of talk to, you know, um, all of those narratives that are out there. You can just sort of tell whatever types of stories occur to you, right? And so I think more, maybe, probably more than anything else, we've sort of been constrained by those sorts of circumstances. That's interesting when you talk about um, having to set the record straight. One of the, I think one of the um, attendees at the, in the trailer said it was true to the autobiography. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, as someone who was involved in the production, how, how much was that like, what was getting the opera right and getting the story right? Or were those the same things? Or like, how, how did that tension play out? I think where the tension plays out, so like the, the libretto is sort of loosely based on the autobiography, not completely, but it's loosely based on the autobiography. And you know, with the libretto and with opera, you have to be super concise. So you know, the autobiography is like 600 something pages and it takes 18 hours, as we know from the live reading, <laughs> to read. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, for those of you that don't know, about a couple of weeks ago or at the end of October, there was a live reading of the entire autobiography, the entire autobiography of Malcolm X and they started at 6 a.m. and it finished at around 10.30 p.m. or 11 p.m. So they read the whole thing and many different people read. So, um, but a libretto has to be condensed and so the way that Dulani Davis did it was really amazing. and. Um, so that part is actually done. What, what the words are going to be said on the stage, what words are going to be spoken and sung from the stage, that is set. But where you have artistic license is how you want to do the costumes, how you want to sort of set the story up, how you want to set these words musically. And what I find so amazing about what Anthony Davis did, along with his cousin Dulani, who made the words, there's many parts of Malcolm X that have jazz influence and jazz inflection. And what he very cleverly did was he basically used black jazz, I mean jazz music, um, from the 1930s and 40s, going all the way to the 60s. So like, you know, in the first act, you hear a lot of big band, Duke Ellington-like stuff, and then let the jazz music progresses as Malcolm progresses, and by the end, by the time he gets to Mecca, it's this uh, blues influenced uh, Miles Davis kind of jazz. So he really kind of brought that element into the story of Malcolm X, who himself was a music lover himself, so. Yeah, and I, you know, we haven't even touched on, if we're talking about Muslims on stage, the, the number of jazz musicians who claimed uh, Islam as their tradition. Um, so there's that, that angle as well. I wonder, um, again, thinking about how black Muslims are showing up on the page and on the stage in, in many of these productions, what, you know, there's a, a figure, there's like the black Muslim figure that comes to signify and perform a certain kind of function, um, in, especially in productions where they're, they're not central, right? Um, and I know that, especially I've seen it in film. I know we're not, the film could be a whole, <laughs> could be oh, a whole thing. But um, what, what are some of the tropes? Um, and these can be, you know, I, I, without value judgment, just like what are some of the things that, that um, black Muslims have, um, have shown up to, like the work that they've, artists have deployed a black Muslim figure to do what? Often, um, generally one-dimensional types of depictions, um, you know, there's sort of like the nationalist, the black nationalist figure, um, that's often sort of like, sort of melded with sort of like um, a tension between their, you know, their talk of liberation and their, you know, propensity for criminality sort of melded into one. Um, you know, there's also sort of this, um, you know, there's often a, a way that black Muslim characters are, you know, sort of these like, you know, you know, embodiment of, you know, a certain type of like respectability, masculinity, um, that's very sort of like narrow and one dimensional. Um, you know, there's, 
there's, there's a number of ways, but then, then there's also sort of the, I mean, and this is particularly, um, you know, moving into more contemporary times, you know, you really start to get this, you know, this complexity with this sort of like, you know, uh, these terrorist tropes, right? You know, and you know, sort of all of the rhetoric around the war on terror, that starts, that starts to come into play um, as well. It was always sort of there, um, I think, um, particularly when we're talking about these black revolutionary, you know, like prototypes um, or archetypes, maybe I should say, um, in earlier productions, but sort of like more interna internationalized, right? You know, and, and more contemporary productions. Um, I mean, I think the commonality that runs through many of these types of, you know, these figures, right, is that they're really precluded from the full range of human lived experience, right? So you're, you're, you're a, a preacher or a revolutionary or an activist, right? But there's sort of a way in which, you know, um, that depiction forecloses, you know, your, you know, your inner hopes or your inner dreams or sort of your inner, you know, contradictions as a family man or whatever, right? Um, you know, there's also a way, there's also, I think, a gendered, you know, there's a very gendered, so it's like, I, you know, I think for black Muslim women, I just, <laughs> do they ever, if, if you're there at all, you're silent, you're, you're docile, but, you know, there's sort of a way in which um, you end up having these crisscrossing, um, these sort of intersecting you know, um, stereotypes that sort of collide with each other, right? You know, this, this image of Muslim women as serene and docile, right? But then also, or silent or oppressed or, you know, seen but not heard, right? And so there's a way in which, you know, there, I think there's been a skewed set of representations in terms of black Muslims that focused on the figures of black Muslim men to the exclusion and silencing of black Muslim women, who have also, which is also sort of like another element of this. Um, I, I think in general for me, it's just um, profoundly unsatisfying, um, you know, uh, to have characters written in this way where not only do they sort of, you know, serve as these one-dimensional tropes, right, but there's a way in which that prevents them from being seen as individual people, right, with hopes, with dreams, somebody's child, um, part of a community, um, you know, all of these different types of things that we all are, right, um, and also having to bear the burden of being representations for all of the rest of us. Like they have to be sort of, they have to be the true representation because this is kind of like the one shot that we're gonna get. And so like we have to quote unquote get it right. You know, can this person be flawed? Can this person, and it really impacts I think um, not only the ways that black Muslim people are perceived in the world, right, which has real material consequences, but it sort of also puts a damper on creativity. Um, you, if you can't write a flawed character, right, that's a really boring story at, at, on some level, right? So I think, um, yeah, I mean, and there are others, but these are some of the, I think, um, repeated, you know, off, most off-repeated um, types of um, caricatures. I wonder, Kazim, in, in the opera, um, and you talked a little bit about the, the constraints of the actual form mm -hmm. um, and how you have to like, can't do a 600 page book, <laughs> right? Um, I, I wonder, in, you know, from your perspective as a conductor, as experiencing this and having to like lead a, a interpretation of it, how, how do you see this playing out? Like how do you accomplish a multi-dimensional portrayal um, while at the same time having this art do the thing that it's supposed to do, like in service of like, you know, I, I don't want to say trope, but like, 
you need a certain kind of character. You need, like there's certain kind of tension that has to drive a story. And some of this is just natural. I mean, Malcolm's story in of itself is cinematic, as you said, yeah. that lends itself to this. But I, I wonder how how do you how do you see that balancing out, right? Like the, without being reductive, um, but still satisfying what the art is supposed to do. So you know, I think the best way to describe how opera can sort of change uh, sentence or some words. So like so, for instance, like you know. It's really interesting because you know if you listen to some of the Malcolm X's speeches and you can hear them on YouTube and you know he actually had a, he did have a sort of a good sense of comedic timing and how do you show that in an operatic sense? So like I'll give you sort of two little scenes that I always kind of inward like inside chuckle because I think oh that's so funny like what he said and. Yeah, you know, so there's like two set. Yes, and if you hear the actual speeches, the people just went bonkers, you know. And so there's the one time where he was like, um, yeah, like you know, like he said, um, oh yeah, like you know, they called me nigger so much, I thought it was my name, and the, you know, the audience goes crazy, and like the way that it's sort of set is like, he says it, and then like the orchestra kind of responds almost like they're. Mm the audience, and so there's like this kind of back and forth that's happening between Malcolm on stage and the other thing. The other sentence that comes later is like when he says, uh, what are you going to do with a slave name? And the way it's said, it's like a jazzy musical. So like, what are you going to do with a slave name? And so it's just funny because it's like, uh, uh, then, then like the whole, yeah, like, you know, you see all of these Nation of Islam characters, you know, like that you would think would just be very stoic, and they are stoic, but at the same time, they sing back to Malcolm X, what are you gonna do with a slave name? And so it's just like there's an aspect of it where, you know, you won't, like, you know, there's a seriousness to it, mm -hmm. of course, in the message. But there has to be, like, you know, and this is what Malcolm X was very clever at doing, also um, bringing a certain amount of comedic levity in order to make the point. Mm. And this is what the opera actually does quite well through the music. So, yeah. It's, it's interesting <laughs> because, so, full confession, this is the first and only opera I've seen so far. Was so you saw it. The opening oh, that. you were at the opening. Yeah, I saw it was at the opening. Um, and I was so there were things about it that were not legible to me because I was not familiar or am not familiar with opera. And I went back um, to a colleague and I said, I, I need you to explain to me this, 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 and this. And he was like, oh, that's what this is called. That's what this is called. And he hadn't seen it. I was just explaining to him what I experienced. And, and I was like, OK, so there's, there's like a whole convention Right? Yeah. Uh, that opera follows that if you're not familiar with, you won't immediately get it. But what's interesting is on the flip side, there's a whole rich, deep culture of black Muslim life and ways of speaking and knowing and being that if you don't know that story, you're not going to get that either. Right. Yeah. So like I the, the all of the references that that were like to Malcolm and his life and like black Muslim life were fully legible to me. Um, and I think just thinking about this, that we're talking about being on the stage and being on the page, what happens when some of it, like, does some of it, you know, like you said to Toni Morrison, it was like, I'm writing for a certain audience. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to get it, some people are not. And my, Malcolm used to have this phrase where he said, um, when asked, you know, from a surveillance perspective about the Nation of Islam, he would say, those who know don't say, and those, those who, who say, say don't, don't know, know, right? So it was, it was kind of like, if you know, you know. Um, and so there is a kind of uh, legibility um, that um, I had, like I was able to, to get things out of this opera, even though I, I did not know like opera. Um, and I wonder, people who don't know, like who haven't heard that speech, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, who have never seen the Star and Crescent, um, who have not heard the Arabic, right? Much of which is not in the captions, right? right. Like, are they getting it or does it matter? Uh, and this is true, I, I tell this joke, 
Um, I, and I don't know about the age of the audience because I can't see because of the lights, but Lauryn Hill's um, doo-wop, that thing, um, you know, she opens with, don't forget about the deans of Serato Mustakim. And I would play this for my students. And, 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 and what she means is the dean is the way of life, the religion, the Serato Mustakim is the straight path. Um, and this is clear reference to Islam. And, but they would be like, I thought she was talking about somebody named Dean, <laughs> right? And that's because that's that, if you know, you know. Um, and so I wonder how, how much does that have to happen for it to work? Knowing and knowing? Yeah. <laughs> that's a good question. I think uh, everybody will, would, like, depending on what your background is, will come with a different understanding of that. Some people will come away with very literal things, and some people will understand the complexity of what's being said. And that actually applies to any kind of opera. Even, mm -hmm. You know, there are Mozart operas that deal with uh, class struggle and class issues that if you are aware of what those were in the 17th century, you, you understand what Mozart was trying to do. If you don't, you just might think, oh, this is just a funny comedy about some, some servants and the people that they serve, but it's actually much deeper if you get into it. And it's the same thing with Malcolm X. I mean, like the messages, yeah, like you can come away thinking, oh, yeah, this is an interesting story, depending on how much you know about the history. But if you know certain little things about it, you, you have a richer understanding. I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm of two minds about it. I, I think, um, on the one hand, I mean, I think, I think Kazim, you're, you're right. Like, in any story, right, you have to sort of, you have to catch up, right, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you enter, you, you pick up a book and you try to read it, you have to sort of figure out like all of the things that you need to know in order to follow the story. Um, and that's, that stretches you, right? Um, and you know, or, or you know, so that's part of what's wonderful about literature and, and theater and artistic production is that hopefully like when you, after you've experienced whatever the product is, right? Um, you've been stretched somewhat, right, from where you were. You learned some new things. You, you, you entered this world, um, which may not even be real, right? You know, um, and, you, and you, you became a part of it for a while, and that sort of adds to your own experience. So there's value in that, and I think there's also value in um, the imagination of of black life beyond the factual. Um, and that's true for the reason, sort of the reason that I was just talking about, but I think it's also true um, f for many black folks, right? We're thinking about, okay, what does this contribute to liberation, right? This is, you know, sort of a lot of, you know, the, the tangling over, the value of these types of, um, you know, uh, endeavors. And I think there's also, there's something in the exercise of sort of opening up your imagination that actually provides new possibilities mm -hmm. for thrust toward freedom. So one way to think about this for me is like, if I take Harriet Tubman, for example, um, you know, and her relationship both you know, to herself but also in terms of people who knew of her in terms of the mythology of the Bible, right? She was you know, known as Moses of her people, um, you know, a lot of the, the sort of the imagery and the metaphors of the Exodus story mapped on to Harriet Tubman's efforts, right? And there's a way in which, you, in, a, in, a, in some sense, right, you're taking a literary product, right, um, or something on the page, right? Um, in this case, you know, for many people, a sacred scripture, right? Um, and you're sort of mapping that onto your own experience in some way. That sort of helps you to figure out how to make a, you know, how to make your way through the world that you find yourself in. In her case, as an enslaved woman desiring freedom, right? And so that story and that imagination and stepping into a character's shoes, right, um, gave her a way to actually enact mm. a freedom struggle, right, that she engaged in for the rest of her life in various ways. And so I, I think for, you know, so there is some value in that. 
I think, just for the exercise yeah. of it, right? Um, then on the other hand, you just, <laughs> you know, it's just, there are those unanswered questions sort of about how, I mean, that was one of the things that I was like, my partner is here, he was at the opera with me, um, and he'll tell you, like, I just kept coming back to this, like, I, like how, if you don't know anything about Malcolm, like sort of what's, what, are, what are people making of this? Mm. And of course there's like, you know, 50,000 answers to that, right? However many people have seen it, um, you know, so I don't have an answer to that, but like, but you do sort of, yeah, sort of, you know, it, 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 yeah, I don't know. Like sort of how, yeah. do, you know, how do people, um, because I and I think I think one of the things that I was most quote unquote worried about, I guess, um, if if I can put it that way, um, is sort of how how do you parse the critique of white supremacy through a product like this? Mm. Again, there are no there's not a clear answer, and I'm not saying you can't. It's just. You know, like, I just wonder about sort of how that works, right? And so for many people, maybe that means you sort of, you leave out of here and you're curious about some things that you didn't know and you go do some additional reading and, you know, maybe that opens up other doors for you. Um, I do, and not necessarily just limited to this opera, but I do think, thinking about, like, these products more broadly and as a cat, you know, just sort of like, are there ways in which... You know, sometimes, you know, there are certain understandings that might be foreclosed depending on sort of what the product is, what the medium is, right? And that's, but you know, it's just, it's, it's a, you put stuff out there and it has to do what it does, right? And people have to grapple with it and all of that thing, all of that sort of thing, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, so one of the things I'm thinking about in terms of like this critique of white supremacy, I mean, I'll, I'll come at it this way. So I was intrigued by your um, example of Harry Tubman being shaped by the narrative of the Exodus, right? Um, and I would, I would think that as she embodies that narrative, she changes the narrative, yeah. right? Um, and so I want to think about how this opera changes opera, mm. right? Um, and in particular, like for me, the, the most memorable scene or a section, see I don't even know the right term. Scene. <laughs> <laughs> is the one that references Malcolm's pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. um, and there, is a, there was a, one of the stills that has like the, the, the lanterns, the lights are hanging, which actually references a famous photograph of Malcolm sitting in, uh, I think it's the Muhammad Ali Pasha Mosque in Cairo. Oh. Um, where you know he's sitting and there's the lights in the background and the kind of set up in a circle. Um, and then again, it's one of those, if you know, you know, right? Yeah. Um, but if you don't know, it's still okay, right. right? But I wonder if we could break down, because there were some really important things that happened uh, in this production or in this scene that were unique, that were true, that were, I think, transformative for a stage like that. Um, so I wonder if you can tell us how you like saw that scene. Because I, I know that we've you talked about talking it, but about. I'm, I'm interested in hearing uh -huh. how you saw that scene. Both the, the setting, the placement of the actors, uh, the, the props, the lighting, the selection of music, um, the lyrics or the chanting, like, tell, tell, because that, you know, like, I mean, again, pardon the ignorance, I'm like opera Italian, like, you know, like, and here you have like Arabic chanting happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, you do have the Arabic chant and you have the prayer happening the whole time, pretty much. Mm -hmm. The whole time it's going through and it's this undercurrent. But what I think that scene does so well, you have that chant and that's like, that's the undercurrent, but undercurrent, but Malcolm X himself had personally some worries about going to an Arabic country uh, and not knowing the language, right? And he, the way that that scene is set up, he first is kind of nervous and unsettled, like, you know, um, I've come so far, so very long, and he's concerned about all these things, but then as he gets to converse with the people, as he gets to sort of see 
the what what Islam represents, how it's represented in the wider world, he is basically becomes at peace with, with what he doesn't know and what he's there to learn. And I think um, that's what that scene very kind of magically does. Like it starts with this chant, he expresses his, his doubts, his worries, and then he comes to come to a realization at the end. And so that's kind of how I see that scene. So, um, so this was probably my favorite scene um, of the of the um, the whole production. And one of the things, and, it, and this is something that again, sort of going back to something as my first set of comments were talking about. You're sort of always like trying to correct the record. One of the things that is absolutely consistently true across these sort of depictions of Muslims on stage, on the page, on television, on film, is that they will 100% um, almost always jack the prayer up <laughs> in a way that I'm looking at this, and I can't help it because, you know, this is, you know, okay, this is something so central to the character of a Muslim, and you have these, all these you know, people sitting in or making moves with their bodies that Muslims don't ever do in prayer or like, and you know, like some of- Saying we, the wrong words. Saying the wrong words, praying. They're like, you know, making salat in front with the television on. It's just, there's like all sorts of like, and, and my, it's to, to the point where like my friends and like, we're like always on a group chat like, did you see this is like so ridiculous. It's so like, it's, you know, so, and sometimes just comedically horrible, right? Um, and so literally one of the first things I noticed, I was like, oh wait, like they actually are praying in a way that's, re that, that, you know, that resembles what we do. Like, so this was like the first like um, moment of happiness in that scene where it was just like, okay, so they're not butchering the prayer. That was like, um, great, but it was also, I think, in some ways, um, just sort of interesting for me as a Muslim who, you know, who prays regularly, right, to sort of see it not, maybe deconstructed is maybe not the right word, but sort of to, to experience the prayer in a, in a completely different way or a very different way than I normally would. There was something really powerful to me about, you know, just sort of, you know, and, and so it's not like a completely sort of literal true to, right, that people are spaced out in a way that you wouldn't be spaced out if you were praying in congregation in a mosque. But like, that's fine, but it's because it, you know, it's, it's sort of that place where you can sort of let go and let your imagination sort of like take in whatever's, whatever's happening. Yeah. So it was a really interesting um, and, um, you know, sort of pleasantly, and it felt good actually, I don't know, just, I don't even know what this means, right, on some level, but it, it felt good that I, you know, like there were no subtitles like on the little screen, right, for that part of, for the, for the Bismillah Rahman Rahim that they kept repeating over and over again. Um, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, right? This is, these are um, words from the Quran. Every chapter of the Quran begins, uh, except for one, begins with these words. And, you know, Muslims will often sort of begin various endeavors, right? With, you know, with these words, right? In the name of Allah. Um, and so it was, it was really, it was really interesting to say, okay, yeah, I, well, I don't need no subtitles for this. <laughs> like, I'm good here. I'm good, you know? So it was just, I don't know. And it was, and I, I just, it was beautiful. Um, you know, it was a beautiful scene. Um, it was, you know, sort of with the lanterns and everything. Like, it was, it was a really, I think, um, and I think it captured for me what was also one of my favorite things about this particular production was that, I mean, even in earlier scenes when, um, when he's in the jail cell and, you know, he's, he's sort of, you know, exposed to Elijah Muhammad for the first time that, like, this is really, in this particular production, really sort of, his, like, the spiritual aspect of it is really sort of highlighted, this, 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 this communication with God, this worry that God won't take me as I am or can't wrap his head around 
you know, the, you know, somebody who's so empty as like we saw in that particular scene, right? And so, so sort of wrestling with his own perceived unworthiness before the divine. Um, and I, one of my general pet peeves tends to be, right, like depictions of Malcolm don't often take his spirituality seriously. Mm. And they really, I think, that came through in a way here that was really, um, that was really refreshing. Yeah, I think. yeah, and I think that scene of of the the prayer scene really does that. Yeah, um, I you know I think uh, a much younger younger me um, would have just delighted to see an acknowledgement, an affirmation, a representation, and we know representation as one of our colleagues, Dr. Suad says, representation is a trap. Um, <laughs> I like to like to desire yes. representation right. can be a mixed mixed thing, but like it was, it was really important to see that. Um, I have, I think, one, one more or two questions, but um, for those of you who have questions or are thinking about your questions, we do have microphones um, at the end of, um, at the back of the room. Please get your questions ready for our panelists. Um, so we have to talk about Afrofuturism, which we haven't, which has been something that's been described in talking about this particular production. Um, because there is a spacecraft hovering over the, the whole goings on. Um, I, I'm not sure where that idea comes from. Do you, do you know where that idea comes from? I mean, I have. The idea theory, came from but... Robert O'Hara, the, the director. Okay. Um, so he had the idea to set it in this Afrofuturistic setting. Right. Mm. And I think the point of it was, was it would be kind of redundant to just have kind of like this bio opera just like, oh, okay, this happened, this happened, this happened. And I think he wanted to set it in a context of what would black people in the future, if like, you know, if say if we're all people that are all in outer space or something in different planets and we happen to come back to earth or, you know, we can travel all over the solar system and black people are part, will be a part of that. Yeah. As we know, we are the future, so. And I think he wanted to just sort of show that and but then also like what will people think about Malcolm X a hundred years yeah. from now, a thousand years from now, in the same way that we talk of like, you know, Shaka Zulu or we talk about Julius Caesar, people will talk about Malcolm X and how will that story be told, you know, yeah. long I, after all. You know, it maybe was unintended, um, but of course it's interesting. So I the way I received it was thinking about the nation of Islam's Theology, which includes what is called the mothership, right? Like there's that there, aspect there's of it that, too. As they, there, you know, yes, like the um, and so thinking about Afrofuturism and how um, it's part of the elements of this, um, it's part of the elements of the Nation of Islam's theology, mm -hmm. um, it's part of the elements of Black life, um, and, and I think you've given us some sense of why it was important. Why do you think it's important for us to incorporate this idea of Afrofuturism in talking about black Muslim life? In, um, I think in many ways, this notion of uh, strictly linear time is not always how black folks experience the world. Um, and this is in, like there's always a way in which we are in conversation with what's happening to us now and what's happened to our ancestors, right? You know, in part because those things haven't necessarily stopped, right? Um, so there's, a, there's a, an element of circularness, if that's a word, um, and sort of how how many black folks across the planet experience time. And so the future and the past and the present are always sort of like feeding into each other. Um, and there's a way in which, you know, I can't, I can't really, you know, I can't think about, if I'm, if I'm sort of exclusively focused on the past, right, I can't sort of figure out how I'm gonna get out of this rut and into something that's more livable. 
um, you know, this is how, I mean, for, for, for us, where so much of our existence is, you know, is just um, not supposed to continue, right? There's so much in the world that sort of, that's conspired to make sure that we are not here. Um, I mean, even if you think about, you know, early, you know, television sci-fi, like, you know, the, you know, the running joke in our living rooms was always like, there, there's no black people in the future, right? You know, God bless Nichelle Nichols, right? Um, it, so there's a, but there's a very real, um, there are real consequences to not being able to project yourself beyond where you are right now, individually and collectively. What do I aspire to? What do I hope for? What do I work towards? Um, how do I get myself out of this trap of, of you know, this whole like white supremacist, patriarchal, capitalist complex? Um, if I can't sort of think about um, a future that offers me something beyond what I have right now. Right, and so there's a yeah. way in which, you know, it's, it's just, it's important. And again, like even think, taking it back to Harriet Tubman, she had to be able to see a different trajectory for her life um, than sort of getting up every day, being subject to the master's whip, working from can't see in the morning till can't see at night, right, in order to actually enact something um, that put her on a different path. Um, so I, it's the, the concept, and I think for Muslims, right, theologically, um, you know, and this of course is, it, this, this looks different depending on which type of black Muslims you're talking about. Like for the Nation of Islam, there wasn't a concept of the afterlife per se, right? But there was a sense of there's a future in which that doesn't look like our past and our present, right? Here on earth. Um, in other expressions of Islam, like theologically, the afterlife, the akhira is the Arabic term for it, right? Um, it's something that's prominently, like that's sort of the whole point of the thing, right? Is the future, you know? This future that you're trying to get to that, you know, where a lot of this stuff that you're dealing with here is not going to be present. So there's always this sort of um, working towards a different, you know, an existence that's, you know, somewhere off where it's not sort of immediately graspable or grabbable, right? Um, so there's a way in which I, I, you can't be black and Muslim without thinking about, mm. you know, futurity. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's just, it's, just a, it's, it's key to, you know, sort of the whole, um, the whole project. I want to see if we have any questions from the audience. Yes, maybe. I can't really. The lights are. So I know it's like it's so hard to see out. <laughs> uh, testing one, yeah. Um, real quick, the the concept of about the past traditionally for us was not a place to relive or rebuild. We built pyramids. We don't have to build pyramids again, but the, it provides a foundation for us to figure out that. We've done great things, so we can do other great things. It wasn't a place to get stuck in. So, because a lot of times, if we only think, if we start our past in 1619, then almost anything will seem like progress. But if we go back a lot further, a couple of millenniums, then we get a better idea of what sovereignty means. But in, in that regard, when you mention about opera as a style, I was really worried for a minute because what it, I heard didn't seem to be rooted in the music that, that Malcolm was so much a part of and identified with. And why do we think that even opera has to be structured in a way that takes that out of the African community? And last but not least, one of the things that bugs me when I, like, with Spike's movie and, and this, Malcolm didn't get his initiation to Islam from Elijah or, in the film, a Muslim in, the, in, the, in, the, in jail. He got it from his brother Reginald. 
was the one who introduced him to Islam. Why don't they use his family as the paradigm? Because family provided the foundation for Malcolm. His family. We're generational pan-Africanists from Marcus Garvey on. Anyway, so I, I should just inform you if you have not seen the opera, and you mentioned Garvey and you mentioned Reginald, and both of those topics are covered in the opera. So the opera actually starts with a scene called Africa for Africans, and Mark, uh, Malcolm X's parents were Garveyites, and the first scene is them in a Garvey meeting in Lansing, Michigan, where, the, the, where they're literally chanting Africa for Africans and talking about Marcus Garvey in the text, so that's one. Two, in the beginning of Act Two, Malcolm's brother Reginald comes to prison. So, you know, if you're showing clips of an opera, you can't show the whole three and a half hour opera in here. You know, you have to trick and choose, so they chose those two clips. But actually, Reginald is a major character in the opera, and he makes his pitch about what Islam was. They don't reference Ella, as her bringing Malcolm to Islam, but she's also a major figure also in act one of the opera. So there is this sense that his family, Ella and Reginald, are both major characters in the opera. So like, you know, you didn't see it here, no, because you can, I mean, you know, you have to be judicious about what you show, but just so you know that the family is in there. Mm -hmm. And you can trust that Dulani Davis and the Davis family were gonna make sure that, um, his story was told in the best possible way. And I, I would add to that as well, <clears throat> like, well, yes, those were sort of the immediate conduits to, to Malcolm in the beginning. He, he also didn't come and continue to live life as a Muslim in a vacuum. There are still sort of, I mean, you, you, he, he does still have you know, a relationship with Elijah Muhammad that is very pivotal and important in his life, right? And so to sort of say, well, it was just his, because it, it was both, right? It's all of those things, right? You know, and there's, a, and there's also sort of the ways in which, you know, Malcolm's family members are in contact with sort of a broader Muslim community, whether we're talking about the Nation of Islam or we're talking about a broader global Muslim community. Um, I think there are, absolutely ways in which the story, especially as told in the autobiography, and we've been on many, we've been together in many conversations about sort of where the autobiography as, as a narrative sort of, you know, doesn't completely tell all of the details of the nuances of Malcolm's journey, right, in and through Islam. Um, but the fact of the matter is that those are also sort of influences, right? Whether they're direct or indirect, they actually do sort of bring him in and through um, his spiritual journey. And before we go to the next question, um, Zaire, I would love if you could sort of respond to the question that you had for Dr. Austin about, or sort of what you were saying about how does this opera actually change opera? Because mm -hmm. I think that's what we were talking about, just sort of, being able to see these kinds of tableaus, you know, on the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Opera stage, right? There are people who go to opera, right? And, and like that is their medium, right? And so what does this do to sort of um, one kind of opera goer in terms of the stories and the imaginations and the considerations that they may have for a story like this being told on a stage that they are very familiar with while also doing some things, as I understand, um, with the music that, that for maybe your typical opera goer is also challenging them around what, what is the sound of opera. So if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe Kazim as well. Um, I, so I, again, not from an opera uh, aficionado, but I, I do think, you know, I think of syncretism, right? Um, and you know, there are all of these debates about like, are you being absorbed into a culture um, or do you also impact the culture that you are engaging? And I don't think that there's anything that um, black people in America, certainly, or in the world, have touched that has been unchanged, mm -hmm. right? Um, that is the creative power and force 
Um, and so even in the most minimal kind of representation, which we've had, like, you know, in, the, in like, not, not now, but certainly in the past, minimal representation has altered the texture, the contours, the narrative, right? Um, just having a black person show up changes the conversation just because of the nature of where we are, right? And this does way more than that, right? And, and to me, um, you know, while, some, while I think I might probably take for granted how new and different this would be for the traditional opera goer, because so much of, of what is new and different is so familiar to me, mm -hmm. right? The star and crescent, the Arabic prayer that is worked into the vocals, right? Of something that is normally not sung in operatic, right. you know, Allah, like, you know, like that's not, like, how it goes, right? I'm not a singer. How's it going? I'm not Will Braverman. <laughs> um, but you know, like the, the, the Arabic that's worked into the lyrics, the, the setting, the, um, the choral background singers who are dressed in, you know, a, a, and I'm, I'm not trying to be funny, but like very Wakanda-esque kind of, you know, like Afrofuturistic clothes, right? Costumes, the costumes, the set design, the transformation of the Metropolitan Opera House to a crash site for a mothership or mother plane, like there's, there's Nation of Islam mothership, there's P-Funk mothership, right? Like there's all of that being pulled into this. There is the, um, the transformation of the stage to a mosque, right? Like that is reshaping, um, you know, willingly, unwillingly, intentionally, unintentionally what an opera is, right? Now, how people respond to that, like I, I haven't really talked to a lot of folks who are like, go to operas to say like, this is how I, I, mm -hmm. I imagine some of this is illegible to them, right? Well, guess what? Welcome to our world. Some of opera is illegible to me. So perhaps we all should sit down together and exchange conversation is like, this is what I saw happening. What did you see happening? And I think that's what art is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I guess I would say, I mean, as someone that's worked on many different operas in many different languages, and, and of course, opera is known as this Italian art form, which it is, but many countries and time periods have taken what opera is and have made it their own. Mm -hmm. And it can only be expected that when opera came to America, that American operas would need to be black operas, mm -hmm. like Malcolm X, like Omar, and yes, and like, you know, Porgy and Bess is kind of, I wouldn't, con it's a, that's a complicated subject for another day. <laughs> I don't want to talk about Porgy and Bess right now, but it's funny that one of the most successful operas in America, in 20th century America, and probably really up until Bernstein wrote West Side Story, the most popular and most well-received opera was about black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're just saying, you know what I mean? So Le Gershwin took those stories and made this opera into something that's kind of become iconic, but it's just interesting that, so you, you can't really separate the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, no matter how hard you try, what is interesting about American opera is black people's contribution to that, to the musical styles and all this stuff and bringing our own sensibilities to that. Just like Germans kind of made opera their own in the 19th century through Wagner and Strauss, they made opera into something very different than what opera was in the 16th century with certain composers. So, you know, it's always an art form that's evolving and um, and it evolves in America with black sensibility. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have, do we have any other questions? If you do, please use the microphone at the back of the room. Um, you know, the reason why I asked that, ask that question, because I think that goes to the gentleman's question, you know, in the end, you can, you're allowed to not like opera right, like you're allowed, no. but also what does it mean for opera to expand, and then also what does it mean for audiences to expand, right, and as you said, like once anybody is in the room, it always changes a thing, and so what, what will opera be, you know, even 25 years from now with the plethora of, of, of operas being written by black people that depict black life in some way, shape, or form, like that, that then gets added, right, 
uh, to said quote unquote canons, if you will. Yeah. Um, and then what will we be talking about in terms of America opera, American mm -hmm. opera in the future? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, sir. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, my question is about the mothership. So you guys touched on it. And from what I've heard, there is a mothership or wheels that seem to follow certain Nation of Islam members around. I kind of saw one in 95. So my question to you is, was that something that also happened with Malcolm X? Or was the mothership like possibly um, just a reference to something? Or was this something you guys made sure it was there just in case someone knew? Um, could you maybe ask that question one more time now? Sure. Well, let, and let I, me. I think I understand the question. Okay, uh, right on. If I if I if I understand correctly, you wanted to know what was Malcolm X's direct relationship or experience with that phenomenon. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I think the I, I don't know that we have any record of that, but what we do know is that while Malcolm X was in the Nation of Islam for the twelve years that he was in the Nation of Islam. He wrote and spoke as though he believed everything that the Nation of Islam taught, right? Like he was a true believer. And the, this, this, the theology around the mother plane existed since the 1930s. So he would have been familiar with that theology. Um, there is no, uh, I don't have any, or we, I don't think we haven't accessed any um, lectures where he speaks specifically about it, but like the way that he speaks about Yaqub, which is, you know, the other, a um, uh, uh, story that people are somewhat iffy about, right? Um, but he spoke about all of the theology of the Nation of Islam with the certainty and certitude of a true believer. So whether or not we have evidence of him talking about it, um, he would have been familiar with it, um, and he would have believed it in that, at least in that, you know, in that, that period of time that he was, was a member. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This will be our last question. Um, I just have a, one question. The, um, what was the premiere of the first uh, viewing for the opera? The premiere originally happened in 1986 at New York City Opera. Okay, and who was the, the director? For the... I think the director, I don't remember the... Oh, wait, you said it premiered here in New York State? I'm sorry? You said the first premiere was here in New York State? Yeah, the, oh, wow. yeah the, it was in New York City. I mean, they did a a quote unquote uh, preview workshop in 1984, 1985 wow. in Philadelphia. Yeah. Sure. But the actual premiere of it being a full stage sure. production yes. Yes. happened at the New York City Opera. Wow, and who would you say the director was? Uh, I don't remember who, what her name was. It was uh, a woman. Wow. Yeah, it was a woman. <laughs> wow. Thank you for your question. And actually, if you, both the Wikipedia page as well as I think the Mets page may have some history of the opera um, on their website that would give you some of those details. I think it's really interesting that the, the premiere of the Malcolm X opera happens just as um, Malcolm is entering into the hip hop canon mm -hmm. uh, with the sampling of Malcolm and No Sellout. Um, and, and certainly in the late 80s, 86, 87, 88, 89, of Malcolm speeches in hip hop. So there is, mm -hmm. you know, there is a, this is part of, I, I was surprised at how early it was actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, because the, what we would consider like the, the, the Malcolm era, the Malcolmologist era, Malcolmology is, is really later, like 88, 89, 90, that, that reaches its ultimate expression with Spike Lee is, I think, movie. Yeah, now, most of the hip hop movement is influenced by Malcolm X. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I want to say thank you so much to our panel here. Thank you for you all for being an attentive audience. Let's give them a round of applause. If you have not picked up a free copy, if you have not picked up a free copy, we do have additional copies outside in the lobby. Also, I mentioned Temple Folk. This is available in the Schomburg shop for purchase. Also consider um, getting a copy from your local library if you're not able to purchase it. And then there was also a discount code for 
um, the opera. If you're interested in trying something that maybe you haven't tried before, or you know someone who that you think might be interested in going to the opera because this is their thing, I hope you will take advantage of that. And I also mentioned that the Apollo on Saturday, I believe, uh, in the afternoon, in the afternoon, we'll also do a live HD simulcast. I have to say those are my actual favorite cons because the sound is amplified and that's what I like. Um, so if you wanna see it, uh, probably maybe a little bit more affordable even, um, please consider looking, up, um, looking it up online at the Apollo Theater. Again, thank you all for being such a gracious thank panel. You. I learned a lot here today and we'll see you again soon. Mr. Photographer. <laughs>